without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our next session. What do you say, Eric? Does that let's sound do good to you? Let's All right. So next, next up, we have Robert and Corey. We're going to be talking about in a full session this time about hacking and defending APIs. I'm going to let them introduce themselves because they have quite the impressive backgrounds as well. So let's bring them on. Rob and Corey, good to see you both. How are you doing? Good. How are you guys doing? Doing Excellent. well, doing well. So you're going to be talking to us? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> A little latency on the internet, you know? <laughs> Corey, you're going to say something? I guess I'll just go and introduce myself. My name is Corey Ball. I'm a senior manager of penetration testing over at Moss Adams, and I wrote the book Hacking APIs with No Starch Press. The book is out with them now, and then the major retail release is a month from today. Nice. Awesome. awesome. And how about you, Rob? Uh, I'm, I'm Robert Wagner. I'm a field CISO uh, for a company called Fletch. Uh, they actually integrate with things like um, Sneak and Go, use a natural language processor to go reading through thousands of articles and then see if any of them are relevant to what you just found in Sneak. So, Wow, that's amazing. Nice. So I think what we're going to do is Eric and I are going to get out of the way and let you both take it away from here. Sound good? Sounds great. All right. All right, we're going to be talking through hacking and defending APIs. Uh, so just a quick little ad additional background. So I'm also a founder of Hack for Kids. We uh, are a charity that teaches kids about internet safety, security, and ethics. I'm on the board of my ISSA. Uh, as you can tell, I love dogs and motorcycles and even taught a dog to ride motorcycle with me. Um, I uh, um, actually... Uh, uh, spent about um, almost 20 years now in InfoSec. Uh, as you knew, I, uh, I said I was a field CISO at Fletch. That means um, you know, I acted in an advisory capacity for other companies to improve their security, regardless of the you're using Fletch, but we do have a free tool that you can actually use. And I'm Corey Ball still. Uh, the only thing in addition to what I've said already is that I'm an evangelist over at appysec.ai. I help spread the good word that they have a tool that is excellent for scanning uh, web APIs for vulnerabilities. That's a really cool scanner. All right, this is an overview of the API security top 10. This is what we're gonna be discussing today. And we're gonna go into this from a uh, red team perspective and Robert as the blue team perspective. And just some of the things that uh, I look for when I'm penetration testing APIs and uh, attacking them. Robert will be discussing some of the fixes that can be applied or, or uh, maybe a mindset that can be applied to help remediate some of these findings. First up, we have API 1, which is broken object level authorization, also known as BOLA. Uh, this is number one for a reason. It is the most prevalent vulnerability that's out there with REST APIs. Uh, Bola vulns are present when an API provider allows the consumer to access resources that they should not have authorization to access. So when I'm attacking an API, typically I'll uh, set up a user A account. I'll go through all of the actions that I can take as that user. And then I will create a user B account and go back through and try and find user A's resources. So here are some typical types of requests that you could see where we're doing a GET request for resource one, or maybe a user ID number, or maybe a combination of something like a, a user account number and then a company name. And I'll just go through, make all those requests as user A, uh, replace the token with user B's token and go back in and see if I can get any uh, positive responses for those same resources. It, it's not the fact here that the API provider is using sequential IDs for resources, although that makes it a lot easier for an attacker. Uh, it's more of the fact that there are not authorization checks going on on the back end that are validating that I am only accessing resources that I should be able to access. And so uh, as uh, being a blue teamer my whole life, my, my job has always been to try and make 
Corey's life as miserable as possible, right? Um, and it, it's not easy here with Bola. Bola is not um, easy to defend against. A lot of people confuse the difference between authentication and authorization. So just because you have authentication, maybe you have an API gateway or, or, or something, maybe even your API firewall, that doesn't help here because once you're logged in, um, you can start messing with the parameters just like Corey explained. So to defend against this, first off, you need an access policy uh, if you don't have one already. Um, and then you're going to have to design authorization in the same way a domain admin would design um, uh, you know, authentication within their, uh, their realm. So you're going to have to go down literally to every attribute and make sure that um, uh, groups then have the correct access uh, to those attributes, right? To those API paths. Um, then you're going to need to require that all access be based on um, uh, the, that authorization and then deny everything else. Now, testing for this isn't necessarily hard. You can start building those tests out in, in something like Postman. But if, the, if your testing isn't automated, it's going to be time consuming, especially when you're looking at thousands of endpoints. So to start looking at how potentially to test that, take a look at OWASP ASVS uh, and NIST 800-162. Um, they're, they're not perfect for this, but they will give you some great guidelines. API 2 is broken authentication. And this is a catch-all for all API authentication-related vulnerabilities. So I, I separate these out into two categories, which is like the classic vulnerabilities maybe something like no authentication or a weak password policy, and then the uh, more relevant vulnerabilities specific to API. So weak JSON web tokens, exposed private keys. Um, as an attacker, what we're looking for, uh, just like the last presentation, we're going through GitHub repositories and we're looking through um, those for any exposed information. We're also looking at the API uh, from, uh, using an attacker mindset. So if I'm requesting information from an API that doesn't require authentication, uh, is there any private information that I can request from it? If so, there should be authentication. Um, yeah, that, that about does it. Robert? Hey, yep. Sorry, I, I actually lost uh, uh, the audio and video there for a second. I'm back. Um, so, uh, so even though we said authorization is the most common, that doesn't mean you can get away with not having authentication, right? It's good to have. Get a get a gateway set up. Um, uh, this uh, vector is all about the, the the authentication flows. So, first thing, get MFA already. If you don't have MFA in your organization, get it and put it everywhere. If, if you buy nothing else this year, MFA is cure so many evils, not just in this space, but so many security domains. Um, if, uh, if just like encryption, don't let your devs roll their own off. That never works out well. Um, there's plenty of libraries that are already created. Remember that it, we're talking about authentication flows and that includes things like the I forgot my password mechanism. Corey can just e as easily abuse that if you don't have good checks there. Um, OAuth and API keys are not going to prevent Corey from, uh, from executing this attack. And when you're not sure, brute force attack your own systems. See if you can get in uh, in various ways, it, if you have the time. If not, hire somebody to do it. Corey's really good at doing that. <laughs> API 3 is excessive data exposure. So excessive data exposure takes place when a consumer uh, makes a request for um, data from an API and the provider sends the whole object back over. And uh, they're counting on the consumer to filter out the data themselves uh, rather than doing that on the provider side. So here, uh, this is a typical request for maybe this user's account. And you would expect as a response to get the ID, first name, last name, maybe the privilege level of that user. But you wouldn't expect to also get maybe the uh, representative or the administrator of the account, uh, their information along with that. So that's something that should be uh, filtered out before it's provided to the consumer or the client. And uh, excessive data exposure is more about 
what can be done with the data than it is about sending too much information. So if, you know, if it also included their address or something else, those are things that you would expect to be uh, with that user potentially. But this other information provides us with an administrator's full name, an administrator's ID number, their email address, and the administrator's multi-factor uh, status. And we can see that's false. So we can leverage this in additional attacks. Um, if we're going after uh, an API, admins are targets that we're looking for. And uh, knowing that one doesn't have multi-factor authentication is going to be great to, to attempt and compromise their account or guess their password. Yep. So defenses here are all about the streams, the data stream in this case. Uh, but um, the, this flaw usually comes about because people wanted to get things done quickly. They wanted to make it work. So they'll do things like just send all the data, right? So uh, they might do something like if you're requesting data from a security cam uh, as API, instead of just sending you the one camera, it sends you all the cameras and expects the client's filter to filter that out. That's bad. You know, all OSP has told us this forever. Clients should never be allowed to enforce any security policy, ever, not ever. Uh, so do things like check for sequential IDs, which can be guessed. Um, make sure that the data coming back uh, is not more than the user is authorized for. If the data has PII, you're, you now have to take this to a lift, diff, uh, an, another level, a higher level, and uh, classify that data, apply policy to that. Um, but always, always, always just be thinking of concepts of least privilege and provide that uh, for your access and teach the devs how to think that way as well. And then a lot of evidence of these things happening can be in the logs, so check the logs. APF4 is lack of resources and rate limiting. Uh, the API is not sufficiently protected against excessive amounts of requests or payload sizes. This can go uh, a few different ways. So uh, rate limiting, is one of the, the key functions that's used to monetize certain APIs. So bypassing this restriction can have financial impacts on that end. And if one user is able to bypass that rate limit, then you're sure that the uh, rest of the internet is quick to find out as well. Uh, if the affected infrastructure doesn't have enough resources, then a certain amount of requests could cause a denial of service. That's not too common. Uh, what's more common is that the infrastructure would scale with the amount of requests and uh, having that just sort of run amok uh, isn't a financially sound decision. <laughs> if there's something simple like rate limiting that could be put in place to prevent that sort of thing, it should be. Uh, the other aspect that is greatly affected by rate limiting would be to... Um, reset a password or, or use that functionality within the API. So if a user is going to guess the reset uh, code in something like this request, then if it's four digits, that could be uh, every potential combination could be guessed in 10,000 requests. And if there's no rate limit, then you can just send over the 10,000 requests and successfully reset the password if there are no other security controls in place. <clears throat> but if there is rate limiting in place and it allows maybe uh, 100 requests per minute, then I can just send over 99 requests per minute until I've guessed the code as well. So the rate limit has to be enforced, it has to be strict, and there should be other controls in place for something like a password reset. Uh, there are also methods that can be used to bypass the, the rate limit altogether as well. And so here you see an example of case switching where I've just uh, put an uppercase A and an uppercase U, and that's still processed to go to that endpoint and to guess that reset um, code, but it's not counted against me on the rate limit. And so if I could do something simple like case switching or adding a question question mark or adding a null byte with case switching, then I'm going to use that tactic in order to bypass any rate limit restrictions to guess that reset token. And, and that's a great example of how hackers think, right? They're constantly looking for, hey, if I just change this a little bit, 
can I get away with the evil that I'm trying to uh, to get away with, right? And, and Corey's very evil. Now, uh, there, the good thing is, is that for things like this, um, there's plenty of ways to defend against it. And your SREs are probably aware of most of them. Docker has built-in limiting functions. There's plenty of ways to throttle requests, responses, the amount of data passed. Um, so put those in place. And then on the back end, Again, logs are your friend. Um, in fact, just about every logging tool out there has some sort of uh, easy way. We're talking even the free tools, right? You can get Elk, whatever. Um, but standard deviation is easy to compute in all of these tools. Um, so just looking for something like plus or minus, well, actually, in this case, plus uh, to standard deviations might give you a heads up. And if you really want to get fancy and start using some uh, algorithms to start modeling that data, uh, free tools like SciPy or our project can help you out uh, when you're ready for that next step. API 5 is broken function level authorization, also known as BAFLA. Uh, this is a similar vulnerability to BOLA, except instead of an authorization uh, problem with requesting resources, it's actually an authorization problem with privileged actions. So in this instance here, there's a put request to update this account. User A should be able to update their account, and user B should not be able to delete uh, user B's, uh, sorry, user A's account. If, if we're talking about something like a FinTech API, BOLA is where I could request information about Robert's account and get back information, maybe his account balance or account ID. BAFLA is more about being able to transfer Robert's money into my account. Not that you'd ever do that to me. Um, so yeah, Baffle is pretty bad. Uh, this is all about you know Corey uh, being an imposter, being being an admin or admin like when when he shouldn't be, and uh, doing those actions. So just like Bola, um, we need to have an access policy to to, to help stop those uh, imposters. Um, again, everything needs uh, access needs to be controlled right down to the attribute level, especially on things like uh, money transfers. Uh, deny everything else. Um, enforce only on the server side, not the client side. The same concepts apply here. Test to make sure that's working. You know, try to act like a hacker and do things like Corey just described, where you're doing transfers on somebody else's account. Um, and uh, again, logs for the win. In this case, uh, you might want to look for things that are rare. And most logging tools have the concept of looking for things that are rare. Basically, you're going to be looking for rare methods to an endpoint or rare uh, calls from a particular account. You won't prevent the attack, but at least you'll have some visibility that things like that are happening. API 6 is mass assignment. This is the binding of consumer input to data models without filtering properties. Uh, in other words, a consumer can pass additional parameters to an application that are automatically added to the internal object. This can take place if developers are depending on obscurity as one of the security controls, or if uh, you know, uh, the user input isn't sanitized or filtered. We see this a lot with account registration processes. And here you see an attack where a post is being done to this account registration. And typically that request would only have maybe username and password and the email address of the user. <clears throat> However, the API provider does have some process to create administrative users and they are using certain parameters to represent that privilege level. So if the user input isn't filtered out, I could try and guess what they're using on the back end for that. Or maybe I could use administrative documentation if that's public and uh, make a, focus my attack more on just the typical parameters that are used. Uh, and I could just send those over in a single request. If there are restrictions on the size of the request, I could just send over a bunch of requests trying to guess, you know, admin true, admin is one, is admin true? all these sorts of things until I get some sort of uh, success. So Corey's just playing here, right? He's looking for clues in, in what he sends and what he gets back from the API that can tell him about properties that he might be able to manipulate. So 
all the previous suggestions uh, still apply, right? Um, we're going to, again, make sure that uh, authorization uh, right down uh, to the to each API's level is, is what we're applying. Um, otherwise, you know, you're going to be left with either disabling mass assignment completely, which would probably break a, a lot of things if you're already set up uh, to allow those, or really what you're going to have to do is do exactly what I said, go back, find out um, each parameter, and then restrict in, uh, uh, each API to only uh, allow those kind of things if you're authorized to take those actions, which is going to be the better choice. API 7 is security misconfiguration. This is another catch-all for all generic security issues. Uh, when, it, when it comes to tooling that's available out for vulnerability scanning of uh, web applications and APIs and, and different systems out there, all of those are really good at catching security misconfigurations uh, when they're set up generically. They're not so good at catching other vulnerabilities on the OWASP API security top 10. So uh, a security scanner may be something like Qualys or Nessus or even uh, you know, OWASP Zap or Burp Suite. From a generic perspective, if you're just feeding it the web application link or maybe even the URL to the API, then the, it'll catch some things like SSL related issues, verbose error messaging, verbose error, error headers, <laughs> verbose headers. Um, but it's not going to catch uh, full of vulnerabilities, baffle vulnerabilities with, without additional configuration. So these are fairly straightforward to find and uh, take advantage of. And they've been around forever, right? We, we're all familiar with everything from directory traversal uh, to, um, to verbose headers. It's been around forever. Uh, Corey loves it because for him, it's, uh, it, there's always an opportunity that something's going to go right. But for us defenders, this is really Murphy's uh, law as far as uh, API security goes. Literally anything that can go wrong will go wrong. There's no way to plan for everything but you should have a plan, right? You should be doing things like patching, updating, and hardening. But if you forget, oops, there, there's a way in for Corey if he discovers it. Um, the, the best way to approach this is just like you do with IT ops, IT security, put in a change management program, a compliance framework, yes, all the boring stuff that we all hate, nobody wants to do, but you've got to do it um, and then enforce those things. Uh, at least your um, limiting the amount of things that can go wrong. Speaking of being around forever, <laughs> API 8 is all about <laughs> injection. Uh, injection flaws that have been around web apps for the past 20 plus years were just ported over to APIs. So SQL injection is still around. We also have no SQL injection. In the right uh, cases, you could see cross-site scripting where you're able to inject information through the API into the web application, and then it's loaded with the web browser and then executed. Also, uh, system command injection. Uh, the way we're, we typically go after these, we're looking for requests that allow user input, and then we're fuzzing the input that's allowed to see which uh, type of injection is successful. So if we send over a bunch of SQL injection attempts, then we're going to review the responses to see if there's any indication that a SQL database is in use or there is some sort of uh, maybe delay in the response if we're doing a blind SQL attack. And then we'll, we'll focus in the attack more from there. So yeah, seriously, 20 years. This has been the bane of our existence. Sorry, bad pun. Um, but, uh, I mean, we've, we've tried so hard. We tried when um, web apps first came out. Uh, all sorts of ways we've tried to take care of this by building perhaps libraries that devs can cut and paste. And it's still around because nobody tends to those things. But for the first time in maybe 20 years, maybe we've got a chance, right? The CIDC pipeline can be instrumented and automated in such a way that the devs can run their own checks. So the best way to defend against this is to test early, test often, create those tests and do it during dev, do it during test, get it before it makes into production, automate it if you can. <clears throat> API 9 is improper assets management. 
So uh, with REST APIs specifically, uh, a lot of time versioning will be included in the URL. So you'll see targetname.com slash API slash v1, v2, v3. Uh, this vulnerability is all about unsupported versions of the API. In and of itself, you're not going to um, be able to you know, find out that API 1 is still in use. Therefore, you've owned the whole application. But instead, this is normally an indication that that version is not uh, supported anymore, like an unsupported software vulnerability. So you have to find this vulnerability, which is often the gateway to other vulnerabilities. If there is a test version or a UAT version that shouldn't be publicly exposed, then we're going to go back through that version of the API and test for the previous vulnerabilities. We're going to test those for Bola and Bafla and Injection. We're also going to go through the GitHub repository to see, you know, is there any public information available about the current version of the API? Maybe some of the issues that were involved in the past version of API. Uh, with the great resignation uh, that's still going on and developers switching careers and everything, I think this is one of the vulnerabilities with APIs that, that could be overlooked and could be very important um, for times to come. And if you have that developer that's maybe responsible for an aspect of V1 or V2 of the API, and they're no longer with uh, the organization that's providing the API, then the, the rest of it could just move on and progress and be updated while this one version is no longer supported. So this is really important to make sure that uh, the versioning is updated consistently across the board and that previous versions are, are no longer available. And really, this is just asset management all over again. Instead of instead of your assets being servers that need to be patched, we're talking about APIs, their versions, and their endpoints, right? So first thing, you've got to document your APIs. Yes, all of them. I can't tell you how many times Corey and I have talked to someone who doesn't have any of their APIs documented. And, and that's, that's just a, a recipe for disaster. So enumerate them. Katie Paxton Fear has an awesome tutorial on how to use Kite Runner. It's a free tool that can uh, go through and enumerate your APIs. Um, check that out. Uh, implement robust change control and asset management processes. And again, all of this can be automated right in the CI CD pipeline. This doesn't have to be a burden on anybody. You just have to put the infrastructure and automation in place. And just like any other OWASP top 10 list, uh, number 10 is insufficient logging and monitoring. Without logging and monitoring and alerting, uh, an attack can run ramp rampant and go unnoticed. There will be uh, little to no chance for attribution and you won't know how they compromise the API altogether. And seriously, logging solves so many problems. It's second probably only to multi-factor. You got to do it. You got to get your logs out there. If you don't start logging, I'm just going to show up at your place and actually make you walk all over the Legos using this presentation. Verify. No, logging's easy. There's free tools. Just do it. Um, and, uh, and it'll solve, well, at least it'll help defend against a lot of problems. Um, we've got about three minutes left, Corey. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Uh, so uh, we can go ahead and take uh, questions, I guess, uh, with uh, with the time we have. Um, if uh, we skipped some stuff, Corey and I have some other great suggestions, but we didn't have time here. You can contact us via our LinkedIn or uh, Twitter accounts, um, and we'd be happy to do that. We're going to make the deck available too, aren't we, Corey? Yeah, that's right. All right. Um, and with that, any questions? Well, one uh, excellent presentation, both of you and Corey, uh, Rob. Appreciate that. Uh, the different perspectives you all were taking and having that type of style to it was really, really um, interesting and helpful to, to get those that insight that way, uh, especially for me that's fairly new to some of the stuff that you're discussing. So oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so far, don't see any questions in the chat just yet. Jesper just shared in the chat saying, great talk. So oh, thank you, another Jesper. round of applause for you there. Um, I did like your, your, uh, the, well, lots of people were calling out the references to Final Fantasy, the Star Wars, hey. Legos, so <laughs> lots That's of props. Awesome. 
We want to make it. It's all it's all represented back here as well. We got Final <laughs> Fantasy, we got Nintendo, and Star Yeah, you know, Corey, I really do. I mean, I want to save time here, uh, you know, for questions about your actual presentation. But I'm super interested in the background and your setup <laughs> and stuff like that. So maybe I will have to talk to you offline uh, sure. and geek out over that stuff. But um, <laughs> yeah. So I guess, well, one the question that kind of came to mind for me at least, and Eric, feel free to pop in when you have a question too. Um, when you, I think it was API eight, the injection one, mm -hmm. right. And then Rob, you're mentioning that that's like 20 years still. Do you, I guess my question to you is more of like a feeler kind of thing. Do you feel that there's ever going to be a, a, a point in time where it's not as prominent of an issue and it's no longer this 20 year long, 25, whatever it may be type of uh, situation that we're dealing with in this space? So to, to uh, yeah, we'll never get rid of it completely, right? But the, the, I think the best way we can get there is to get tools in the hands of the devs that probably just get built right into the build, right? The build kicks off. It automatically calls a sequence that tries to do you know, some basic SQL injection um, and check for all the low-hanging fruit. And, and then once they get the go-ahead, being able to just uh, go to the next step of, uh, of their build and publication would probably be the most efficient way to do that. And, and that, and take the time to teach the devs, like show them what a SQL injection looks like. A lot of them have never seen someone abuse their app with SQL injection, right? Yes, you're preaching to the choir right now. <laughs> and past past roles that I've had, the, our security team was very hesitant to educate us as developers on like, what it is that we need to defend against. And if we don't see it, how the heck can you expect us to just blindly know what to do? So exactly. Security should be the bridge here. We need to take our devs out for a couple of beers and, uh, and run them through juice shop or something like that and show them what happens. For sure. Eric, anything to add from your end? No, I mean, you know, I was thinking about the injection piece too. And I was wondering maybe there's something we can do around, you know, what Jonathan was talking about with CI uh, fuzz testing and have, automated injection you know are you are you able to pass interpolation strings in that you know to catch things like what log for shell was doing and all that kind of stuff so a lot of stuff but you know the one critical piece that I, I'm, I'm gonna have to get with you offline rob is how do you get your your dog to ride a motorcycle <laughs> <laughs> so I, I am quite an accomplished amateur dog trainer. I will be happy to step you through that process. It was uh, it was a lot of fun actually. I oh, had wow. him riding in about two weeks. Uh, oh my god! Tiny little steps, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Well, before I let you go, Rob, also, I want to let you know, you can make me walk across Legos all day. I am used to it. I have kids, so ah! that's not hey. that, that painful of a... I'm sure, Eric, you can attest as ah, well. Damn, yeah. you're immune. I'm immune. <laughs> Corey and Rob, thank you both so much. Really excellent talk, and I uh, hope to see you around again sometime, too. Awesome. Thank awesome. you guys so much for Thanks having us. It's been great. See you.